My name is Troy McIntosh. I'm the head of school at Worthington Christian Schools in Columbus, Ohio. And I served as the lead evaluator of the team this week. Joining me uh, here in this presentation is Jim Parrish. He served as the assistant lead evaluator. He's also the assistant head of school at Worthington Christian uh, in Columbus. Uh, we had four other team members uh, from, uh, the, that served on the team. Um, Steve Casaguran is guidance counselor at Cuyahoga Valley Christian near Akron. Linda Hoflich is elementary principal at Mansfield Christian. Um, uh, Jean Nyhart is a math teacher at Christian Academy of Louisville. And uh, Christina Boffman is guidance counselor at Christian Academy of Sydney. And the six of us formed the team this year. Many of you may have seen us around, uh, poking in your classrooms or uh, wandering the hallways. The point of our visit was to um, uh, create a report that we can ultimately present to the school, but more importantly, well, maybe not more importantly, but just as importantly, to the Regional Accreditation Commission. Um, that is the commission that ultimately makes deci the decision on accreditation. So that, does not, that authority does not rest with us. Uh, we simply create a report that goes to the commission and they use that report as a basis for making their accreditation decision. So there's going to be some gap of time before you hear on whether you receive your, your renewal or not. Uh, the commission does not meet until June, and so they won't even take up uh, you, uh, the report until then. So it'll probably be sometime this summer that you'll hear of um, your approval or not of your um, uh, accreditation. It would be for a new five-year term. The previous term was seven years. Uh, they have changed the protocol, and the longest term you can now receive is five. So if you do receive renewal, you get to do this again, all over again, in just five years. Congratulations. Um, I want to share with you today a kind of a summary of what the accreditation process looks like, just so you guys understand uh, what it is the school is going through. It's a commendable process. Um, fewer than half of all ACSI schools go through the accreditation process. So the fact that you were willing to be transparent enough to subject yourselves to a set of outside criteria, a set of outside evaluators, is commendable. And we believe strongly that this is a powerful tool for school improvement and growth and trust that the work that you've done is going to pay off over the next five years in allowing you to continue to move toward the kind of school that you envision a manual uh, being. All right, so let me just talk a little bit uh, about the process. Um, the, you are receiving accreditation, you're seeking accreditation uh, through two separate accrediting bodies. The first one is ACSI, which is the largest Christian school association in the world. It represents over 20,000 Christian schools, 16,000 uh, international schools in over 100 countries, and more than 4 million students. That's the you currently hold ACSI accreditation and have been members of ACSI for some time. So if your teacher's here, even if your parent's here, it's probably a, an organization you've at least heard of, right? You are also seeking uh, joint accreditation with Advanced Ed. Advanced Ed is not a Christian organization, but it is um, a secular school accreditation agency that represents over 30,000 public and private schools throughout the United States and over 70 countries, including Department of Defense schools, and uh, it represents over 15 million students. Most of your public schools in the area, Sylvania, Toledo, Whitmer, Washington Local, those are going to be accredited through Advanced Ed. It's the old North Central Association, that may be a term you're more familiar with, North Central merged with Western to become Advanced Ed and they're now the largest secular accrediting, body, uh, accrediting agency in the country. Okay, so you would be, re, you would be jointly uh, accredited by both of those agencies. Uh, the way the partnership works is Advanced Ed supplies the protocol and electronic tools, ACSI supplies the chair and team members, and they also ensure adherence to biblical worldview and foundations through the assurances and focus questions on every standard. So if you were a part of the accrediting process, the self-study process, you're probably familiar with those assurances. There were 46 separate ACSI assurances that uh, a school has to meet uh, in order to uh, become accredited uh, by ACSI. 
So just briefly, uh, the purpose of accreditation, it builds capacity of the institution to increase and sustain student learning. That's the whole focus of accreditation, right, is to become a better school so that you can better serve your students, improve the performance uh, and learning uh, of the students that you serve. Stimulates and improves effectiveness and efficiency throughout the institution. So operations, instruction, uh, teaching, um, finances, purpose and direction, those are all things that we, uh, uh, we look at. There are five standards, and I'll talk about those uh, in just a minute. The purpose of our visit is to come in and verify that, number one, that you, you are what you say you are, um, and then number two, that you meet the uh, ACSI and Advanced Ed Assurances and the five standards uh, for accreditation. So we're looking at a number of things. We come in and we're looking at a tremendous amount of documents. We're looking at curriculum guides. We're looking at application materials. We're looking at student enrollment materials. We're looking at standardized test scores. We're looking at copies of exams. We're interviewing board members. We're interviewing faculty members. We've met with parents. We've met with students. Uh, there's a huge amount of data that we've poured over over the last four days. Um, and trying to get at an understanding of stakeholder perception, student performance results. Okay. We talked about that already. Talked about that. As I mentioned, there are 46 ACSI assurances, things that ACSI has indicated a school that wants to receive accreditation by ACSI has to meet these things. And because of the distinctive of ACSI, they relate to Christian philosophy, Christian worldview, biblical integration within the curriculum, spiritual development and growth and care for the students, those kinds of things. There are 46. It's the, it's the opinion of the visiting team that ECS meets 45 of those. Okay. The remaining assurance was only partially uh, met because uh, there was a, the, the, the assurance requires um, annual review of faculty. And there were some faculty that have not been reviewed on an annual basis. It's not particularly problematic when it comes to an accreditation decision, although you will see that particular problem shows up in things that we are recommending for the school uh, in just a bit. Okay. All five of the advanced ed assurances were met without concern. There are, as I mentioned, there are five standards to the accreditation. Purpose and direction, governance and leadership, teaching and assessing for learning, resources and support systems, and then using results for continuous improvement. Those are each scored on a scale of one to four. Okay? And each standard has a set of indicators underneath, ranging anywhere from some standards only have five or six indicators, where the teaching and assessing for learning has as many as 12 indicators. Each of those indicators receives a ranking based on a rubric that Advanced Ed provides. This is the score that the visiting team assigned, uh, the average score that the visiting team assigned to each of these standards for you. So two represents kind of a minimal level of, of um, um, fulfillment of the standard. Four would be exemplary. Uh, fulfillment uh, of the standard. Under purpose and direction, uh, the average score was a 2.33. Same thing for governance and leadership. Teaching and learning resulted in a 2.67. Resources and support system was a 2.86. And using results for continuous improvement was a 2.4. We'll talk a little bit more about each of these standards. As I mentioned, we did 28 classroom observations. If you're a teacher in here, I hope you remember or uh, that we came in and spent 20 minutes in your classroom, <laughs> right? I'm sure you didn't forget that. We use a form that, a that Advanced Ed produces called an Elliott Observation Tool. There are seven domains within the Elliott Observation Tool. Uh, they're listed right here. E under each of these domains is a number of subcategories, subcriterion, that allows us to determine whether a teacher is fulfilling or how, what level they are accomplishing these seven domains. These are also scored on a scale of one to four. Okay. Uh, a one being that we did not observe that when we were in the classroom, and a four being an exemplary uh, level 
of um, demonstration of that particular domain. These are the average scores for each of the domains based on the 28 observations. Now, what I think is particularly commendable about this is all seven of these domains, um, ECS scored higher than the national average uh, uh, in the advanced ed network. So of those 30,000 schools that get, receives accreditation by advanced ed, all seven of your domains were higher than the network average of those 30,000 schools. I think it's particularly commendable. There are going to be differences even within the domains. If you look under the domain of a well-managed learning environment, which was the highest score, and I would say significantly higher than the network average by almost a half a point, okay? Um, there will be some that were particularly strong, some subdomains under that domain that were particularly strong, particularly in the area of um, uh, respectful relationships between the teacher and student. That's something that the visiting team saw over and over again, that there was a high level of respect, trust, engagement, relationship between the teachers and the students. That score was actually, I believe, almost a 3.8. Okay. Um, there are others, if you look at digital learning environment, a 2.1. Well, one of the, the things you keep in mind about Elliot, we're only in there for a 20-minute 20 um, period. And if we come in, it's completely understandable that there's no use of technology during that 20 minutes. If we don't see it, though, we have to mark it as a 1 because we didn't observe it. So that, that score always tends to be lower. Even though it's significantly lower than the other scores, it is still higher than the network average. And the network average uh, was about a 1.8. There was a self-assessment that you guys completed um, several months ago. It was about a year-long process. I started working with Jeff and the administrative team about a year ago on the self-assessment. The visiting team started reviewing that document about four weeks ago. There were 16 members, as I already mentioned. We spent four days here in Toledo, 28 classroom observations, 20 interviews from stakeholders. That included groups of interviews, like the faculty interview, that we had earlier this week, a board interview, administration interviews, um, church leadership interviews, parent interviews, individual interviews with individual people, total about 20 interviews. We had four larger meetings uh, with them also. All of this led to the development uh, of some what we call powerful practices in the report, as well as some opportunities for improvement. You can think of them as strengths and weaknesses, right? But because we're educators, we have to come up with terminology that nobody else really uses, right? All right. Powerful practices. Uh, the external review team has recognized that uh, Emmanuel Christian demonstrates the following powerful practices, characteristics, or achievements. There's at least one in each standard. Okay, and standard one, which remember had to do with purpose and direction, uh, we recognize that ECS administration has consistently communicated the school's mission to faculty, staff, parents, and students through written documents such as the student and teacher applications, student and teacher handbooks, faculty meeting reviews, and periodic communications with families. This consistent practice has created a culture of shared purpose that allows the school to be more effective in implementing its mission. One of the things that we felt we saw over and over again was that there was a consistent and uh, unanimous agreement on what kind of school ECS ought to be. Okay? Even to the point that large numbers of people, and maybe even all the faculty, could even... <laughs> started to break down into a recitation of the mission statement when, I went, when they were asked about it, okay? But even when we talked with board members or parents or even students, there was a large-scale, widespread agreement on, even if it was, they couldn't state the mission statement, the spirit of the mission statement was readily identifiable by all of them. And I think that's to be commendable, and I think it speaks to the effort and time that the school has put into sharing that with their stakeholders. Without that agreement it becomes very difficult to try to accomplish and implement uh, the mission. So that, the fact that you have that in place, I think, speaks well uh, for the future of uh, the school. Powerful practice under standard two, which had to do with governance and leadership, uh, is the school administration has developed faculty and staff applications that identify candidates who share the school's mission and will possess the character, commitment, and qualifications to move the mission forward. We saw this in two different ways. We saw it in actual documents and hiring processes, but then we also saw it in the fact that you have a faculty who is unanimously committed to the mission of the school. 
And so I think that speaks to the hiring process uh, that the school has in place. Very powerful. We had three powerful practices under the third standard, which had to do with teaching and learning. The first one is the board and administration has created the position of director of discipleship in order to oversee the mission-directed goal of the spiritual formation of students. The director has initiated student ministries, chapel planning, book studies on worldview, and student book studies on discipleship. I think that's a, a pretty unique uh, position and something that the, the school has identified as an area of need that um, is going to be able to allow them to more fully um, you know, kind of accomplish that mission of student discipleship. Secondly, the administration and faculty have initiated the Omnibus Program, a classical Christian approach to integrating Bible, English, and history into a challenging three-period class for qualified students. That's really unique. There aren't many schools that are doing this, um, and it's really a way that you can um, provide for um, uh, those students who are ready for a more rigorous challenge uh, in, uh, in the high school. Thirdly, the administration and faculty have opened Christian education to a wide variety of students, including those with special needs such as health impairments, autism, and learning disabilities by investing in a special education program that meets their needs. I will say we found this particularly commendable. It is unusual for a school of 350 to be able to offer the wide range of services, uh, special ed services uh, that ECS provides. And the fact that uh, the school is willing to open their doors and provide Christian education to students who don't fit the normal um, uh, classification, the normal stereotype, is, is very commendable. Those students benefit and gain as much from a Christian school education as anybody else. It's expensive, and that's why so many schools don't do it, particularly schools of this size. And so it's commendable that you guys have made uh, the commitment to having uh, and serving students like that in your school. There were three under standard four as well. Uh, your school facilities, uh, when I was, uh, I served as your lead evaluator in 2007. If you were around in 2007, you know that was a traumatic year in the life of ECS, right? Because just a few months before I was scheduled to come with the visiting team, uh, you had your, uh, the fire that really gutted uh, your high school wing. And it resulted, though, in what we perceived to be very good facilities um, and, and, allow you to really have excellent facilities to match um, the program that you're trying to accomplish. The fact that a school this size has two separate gymnasiums, two separate cafeterias, that allows you to do course offerings and flexibility in your scheduling, I think is commendable. Um, <clears throat> secondly, the board and administration have managed the finances so that the school heard, holds no long-term debt and maintains a $1.8 million endowment and $300 stability fund that relieves a significant amount of financial pressure from the budget so that additional programming may be added that benefits students. Um, the, it is a, I cannot understate or overstate how big of a deal is that the school does not hold any long-term debt. Um, uh, in addition, a $1.8 million endowment is, uh, put, I, I, I don't have data on this, but I would guess puts you in the top 25% of all Christian schools in the state. Um, the stability fund that you have in place, like a rainy day fund, uh, that allows you to be flexible in your budgeting and future um, uh, budgeting is, is extremely commendable. You're, this is not a school that's in danger of financial decay and ruin, and I think that there's a lot to be commended for that. The administration and technology department has invested heavily in high-speed wireless network that provides faculty and students reliable access to digital learning resources. And then one practice under standard five, the school has created a strategic plan that has allowed them to identify problematic areas, including the creation of the positions, um, I guess that should say address problematic areas, including what, we, what was perceived as administrative deficits uh, with the creation of the superintendent, director of admissions, and director of discipleship. There were things that people were taxed, were, uh, there was too much administrative work to be done uh, with the amount of people uh, that you had. And the strategic plan allowed the school uh, to identify those areas and address them through the creation of these positions. Opportunities for improvement, uh, those exist for each standard as well. Under standard one, again, which was purpose and direction, was we are asking the school to initiate a collaborative effort by September among multiple stakeholders to revise the current strategic plan 
to one, reflect the new uh, vision statement, and two, reflect the commitment to significant changes in the school governance structure for the 16-17 school year. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in the governance and uh, leadership standard. Under standard two, which has to do with governance and leadership, we are asking the school to adopt a thorough and research-based evaluation process for the annual evaluation of the superintendent. And then the final two rise to the level of work, what is being called required actions. There are four opportunities for improvement, two of which you'll see here, that are necessary for you to complete or address over the term of your accreditation in order to qualify for renewal. The first one is um, to provide more thorough, uh, I'm sorry, this is, these are not required actions, is that right, Jim? Required actions will come later. I got ahead of myself. Uh, the third one is to, this is just simply an opportunity for improvement, not a required action. I misspoke. Provide more thorough training for faculty on the process of authentic biblical integration that develops a full biblical worldview in students. And train faculty on curriculum development and implement a process of regular curriculum review to improve classroom instruction and eliminate potential gaps or overlaps in the scope and sequence. Under standard four, uh, we're recommending that the school clarify in the teacher and student parent handbooks which faculty members have high school guidance counseling responsibilities. The handbook currently lists a high school guidance counselor position and department that no longer exists. The assignment of responsibilities should include a plan for the seniors who do not or cannot take the senior seminar class, as well as guidance services for underclassmen. Standard five. Uh, we are recommending the school create a plan for addressing the growing gap between students' anticipated Terra Nova scores and their actual scores so that students' actual achievement matches or exceeds tested ability. We did see a trend in test scores that showed that um, as students advanced through the grade levels, there became a gap between what their Terra Nova predicted their Terra Nova scores would be and what their actual scores would be. So we're asking that uh, the school create a plan to address that growing gap in the test scores. And that's somewhat related to the OI we mentioned earlier about analyzing and using uh, standardized test data. There were four required actions. These are the things that we are saying the school must address over the term of their accreditation. The first one is complete a governance restructuring that has actually already been started uh, complete a governance restructuring that grants authority to the school board, commensurate with its responsibilities, flattens out the organizational structure to allow for more nimble decision making and clarifying lines of authorities. This was something we heard a lot of, not so much from teachers or parents, but a lot from school board, administration, church leadership, a recognition that the current governance structure leads to decision making issues. And so we uh, feel strongly that that restructuring that has a significant amount of work already taken place and commendably with the full support of administration, the school board, and church leadership, what we're asking is that process be completed by the 16-17 school year. Secondly, was complete thorough and research-based evaluations on each faculty member on an annual basis. Uh, we believe it's very important that teachers receive fair, accurate, research-based feedback that is going to promote their development uh, as a teacher on an annual basis. And um, that has been done on a somewhat inconsistent, spotty basis in the past with a tool that I know is going through a revision process right now. We're encouraging, or actually not encouraging, we're actually requiring um, that process to be done annually and that the new tool be subject to um, the, the, the literature on what effective a teacher evaluation processes look like. The last two required actions, train faculty in the interpretation and use of test scores and other evaluative data. Perform an annual comprehensive analysis of standardized test scores to guide curriculum review and instructional practices. The school, as I mentioned earlier, has invested a lot of time and resources into standardized testing. Okay, there's Terra Nova, there's um, 
uh, well, you, for your uh, Ed Choice students, you've had um, the state assessments, you've had OGT, you've had PSAT, you've had ACT. There have been this whole range of data that you have, but there wasn't a whole lot of evidence that it was being used, that the data came in and then it just kind of sat there, maybe was read, but it wasn't really used to affect curricular decisions or instructional practices. And so we are requiring that there be a systematic approach, a formal approach to training faculty on how to handle this data and then, how, and then use it to make, to drive your curricular decisions and your instructional practices. And then lastly, utilize annual faculty evaluations to identify school-wide professional development needs and implement a plan to provide necessary training. The visiting team felt that it was very commendable uh, in terms of professional development that each teacher be required to draft and submit a plan to the LPDC for their professional development for the year. You're probably familiar with that, the 18 contact hours that you have to have. What we saw and what we even received teacher feedback from, uh, but we saw in other areas as well, was that there wasn't any coordination between each of the teachers and it was not connected to a school-wide plan for professional development. So there lacked a coordinated approach so that teachers began to um, independently seek out things that may or may not have had direct relevance to school-wide professional development goals, but it satisfied the hour requirement. So what we're requiring the school to do is to develop a systematic school-wide approach to professional development that identifies school-wide goals, school-wide needs, really based off of faculty evaluations. We feel like the, the lack of faculty evaluations that have been taking place have crippled the ability to develop a systematic school-wide coordinated approach to professional development. So I think those two, those two goals, those two requirements are really hand in hand, using the faculty evaluations to drive a school-wide plan uh, and approach to professional development. Okay. Here's the way that works, I touched on it earlier. Uh, your, your external review is now complete. Right? As soon as we leave, uh, that part of it is finished, and you guys can go, whew, that was a load uh, off. Uh, within the next 30 days, uh, ACSI will return uh, the completed report to you. There's still some editing and final work uh, that we need to do on that before we submit it to ACSI. Within 30 days, though, you'll get a final copy of that. Uh, that is what really will serve as your guidepost uh, for uh, the term for the five years of accreditation should you receive approval for that. And then in June, uh, the commission will ultimately be the one that grants your accreditation status, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, I want to thank you guys on behalf of the team. Uh, the, the people who lived in the school building shared their building with us uh, for the last four days were awesome. They were incredible, uh, starting with Jeff all the way down through Bob and Mike and uh, administrative support staff in the, uh, in the high school. Mrs. Christiance, who gave up her library for three days. Um, uh, just incredibly welcoming, uh, supportive. I think it is indicative of the preparation that the faculty and administration did. The fact that what the team found when we showed up was largely what the school self-identified uh, in their self-study. I don't think, as I share with, with uh, we, share, we had an administrative preview right before this, and I don't think anything, all three of the administrators that were there said, what you're sharing is not really anything we didn't know ahead of time. And that's, that's great. That's what you want, right? That indicates that there's uh, this, the, the self-awareness to know here are areas that we want to grow in. We recognize that. Uh, it would be problematic if a visiting team shows up and their opinion differs greatly from the administrative opinion. And that's not the case at all here. Uh, there is, by and large, uh, widespread agreement between what we saw as a visiting team and what the school has identified in their self-study. Uh, self uh, finally, Psalm 78, I think, speaks to this whole uh, if, uh, accreditation process. That the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And I just want to thank you guys for the work that you do in the northwest part of the state. Uh, it is one of the, you know, I, my context is central Ohio. 
but one of the great things that I love doing is getting out and seeing other parts of the state, other parts of the country, and seeing people engaged in the exact same process that, you know, I live in every day in Columbus. Uh, you guys are doing a great work here. I commend you for it. Uh, you will um, hopefully uh, continue to reap the benefits of that, and your students will reap the benefits of that. Uh, I think there's, uh, you guys have uh, something very much to be proud of here in the best sense of that word, proud. Um, God is doing a lot of really cool things here, and I, I, I hope that you guys appreciate what you have at ECS, and uh, you'll see this whole process of being one that eventually helps you uh, become the best school that uh, ECS can be and the one that God called you to be, okay? Thanks for coming. Uh, appreciate it. Appreciate your, uh, your love for the school. I know the, uh, the faculty and administration do as well, all right? Have a great afternoon.